Hello and welcome to China Econ Talk. Uniforms from the podcasting game? A pipe dream for China Econ Talk, but not perhaps if I was the owner of an audio platform here in mainland China. Companies like Himalaya and Yudao have tens of millions of daily users and multi-billion dollar valuations. So what are the main differences between the Western and Chinese podcast ecosystems? And what shows should I be listening to right now in Mandarin? Yang Yi was a senior man was a senior editor at Yitai China and a podcast host in his own right, and has just left his full-time job to start a Gimlet-inspired venture here in China. Yang Yi, welcome to China Econ Talk. Hi, Jordan. Thanks for having me. So, how did you first get interested in in audio, radio, podcasting in general? Well, actually, I'm a longtime radio fan. I listen to the radio receiver, the FM or AM radio, and of course, in in China, we we have a, a word called. Uh, Toting Di Tai is a you listen to some the radio station overseas mm. like the Voice of America or BBC World Service that I am one of them. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, when I was a child, I just I have a habit to listen to radio. So uh, yeah, I have a really long time uh, personal history about audio, but about podcasting, I I think it's just during my uh, college. So what were the what were the short of shows that were on the air back when you were a kid? You're you're how and you're how old now? Actually, the the first time to listen to radio is very is very small, maybe three or four years old. But sure. uh, I remember uh, my my first time to listen to the the Vo- Voice of America or BBC Chinese Service is uh, around uh, nine or ten years old. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and actually, yeah, of course, I could receive some information I never heard in China before. But that's not a point. I truly have a deep impression is is about the format of the show interesting yeah i remember there is a english teaching uh, program uh, from voa it's called english cafe i remember so they just want to show how american people talk in a cafe so <laughs> yeah so i could i i could hear a background in a cafe and there's two uh, two guys that talk to each other, and they will, and there is a, a host that will tell you, oh, what's the key words in their conversation? I remember that feeling. I just like sit in the cafe, and there's just two guys just sitting next to me. So I I remember that feeling. So I think, oh, the radio program could do like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. I I remember have a, having a similar experience. The N- the NPR station I grew up in, they had an hour or maybe two hours a night of BBC World Service, uh, yeah. and just hearing the different accents and the reporting from all around the world, I was like, wow! Like I'm just like I'm traveling just by <laughs> just by like sitting in the bath listening to this stuff. It was a uh, it was a really cool experience and something special about radio. I think where you can just it can just transport you like that. Yeah. So what would the 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 VOA shows in contrast to? Uh, what you were listening on domestic Chinese radio. What was going on from an industry perspective is, and how did that lead down to the types of shows that were going on broadcast? In China, I think the radio station usually, their format is usually like the, the local radio station in America, not the public radio. It's like a commercial radio station in America. So there's a lot of the coin show or there's two hosts would chit chat or play some music. The world news in the Chinese radio station, uh, usually they just announce it, read the manuscript, we use some clips is recorded from the television. Sure. So that's totally different from, uh, you know, it's a, it's an audio only reporter. It's a, it's a different feeling. So there is the reason behind that because after the cultural revolution, China's radio station is need to reform like everyone else do. In the middle 1980s, so uh, there is a, this, a radio station called Zhujiang Jingji Guangbo Dian Tai, the mm. Paul River Economic Radio Station. It's close to Hong Kong. So uh, this is the first radio station used uh, a format the Chinese radio station never used before. It's live broadcasting because mm. before that, every show is recorded, and the announcer or anchor will just read the manuscript. They learn from Hong Kong's radio station and uh, learn the live broadcasting format and like calling let audience have an opportunity to uh, uh, participate into the show, sure. or uh, they will have. Every show has a two to three hour slot, and the, the hosts could arrange the manager different, like news bulletin, the music, the traffic, the weather, very flexible. So 
that is the first time in in China the 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 radio station who use this kind of things to arrange their uh, schedule, arrange their programs. So at that time is some kind of innovation in China. Mm. Since mid nineties to mid nineteen nineties, the reform go deeper and deeper. So now in China, even average radio station is state owned, but actually it's a business radio station because they need to earn money. They turn to the commercial advertise for funding instead of uh, the government funding. Mm. So they need to have take the responsibility for the money. So they, they, they will find the Zhujiang model, the Zhujiang uh, Paul River radio station is, uh, is a very easy way for them to learn because every radio station just need to cover the whole salary. This very low budget, but the advertisement is very high. Sure. For a commercial radio station, I think it's perfect mm -hmm. <laughs> for them. But in my opinion, uh, it has a big impact or influence to the whole Chinese audio industry. I think there's no professional audio producers now. So people don't know how to produce the show like storytelling because, you know, the storytelling show is complicated. Sure. There's a, um, uh, there was a movie that came out in 2016, uh, mm -hmm. which I think was like a great little window into this, into what commercial radio uh, mm. is like. You know, there's these like two hosts and they're, they broke up and they're in love, but basically they're competing for rating and they have call-in shows and people are, you know, telling them their love stories or whatever. <laughs> um, but, you know, as you were saying, there's no on the ground reporting. It's, yeah. it's just one person in a microphone, which is very cheap, which is also, you know, what the vast majority of uh, American radio is where, you know, there's one or two hosts um, yeah. doing like, you know, Rush Limbaugh style or talking mm -mm. sports yeah. or just hosting, uh, you know, gossip news and, and music. But what's different is uh, in the U.S. And, and, and U.K. at least is you have the BBC and yeah. you have NPR and all of its affiliate stations, which have a ton of money uh, from the public as well as from the donations yeah. to invest in this sort of storytelling and, um, mm. and reporting. And as uh, you know, followers of the Western podcast ecosystem all know, many, many of the best and brightest from the Western podcast ecosystem grew out of or were trained by people who. Um, first made their marks in public radio. Yeah, because, um, yeah, just l like you mentioned before, BBC has a radio too. It's a pop music radio station. It's have a very high salary host like the Chris Evans. The Chris Evans show is, sure. uh, yeah, it's a long time, uh, two hour breakfast show and just play music. So it's fine because it also has a BBC Radio 4 and a BBC World Service. So this two national or international channel will provide opportunity for high quality audio production. But you know, in China, we didn't have this opportunity. Every show is just like call in, chit chat, play music. And you know, in late night, we have a show is about emotional, about the people's relations, just like, and I remember there is American movie, Sleepless in Seattle. Yeah. There is a, a, a radio host called the Dr. Marsha Fieldstone. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so the Tom Hanks song is calling to that show. We have a lot of that kind of show. On one hand, it's, it didn't give us the opportunity to uh, educate professional audio producers. But on the other hand, is it teaches the listeners and audience about what is radio program or what is audio. Let, let people think, oh, only this kind of show is radio program. Radio program is just a long-form talk. Just like now in China, I think maybe 99% of Chinese podcasts is a talk show. Yeah. Because everyone, not just listeners, is about podcast producers just think, oh, I have an opportunity to host an audio program. What's what's interesting though is you know when you're when you're driving around in taxis or listening to the radio, yeah. the other the other thing you hear besides call on radio is you have xiangsheng, mm -hmm. and then you have people telling like like sangua stories, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's a which, story. which is an interesting different type of storytelling, which isn't necessarily something you see in the West. Yeah, last September, the Economist wrote a obituary about a China famous storyteller called Shan Tianfeng. Do I? Yeah. So uh, that is the, the show you usually listen on the taxi. So I, I read that article about, oh, in the Western view, Shan Tianfeng is our storyteller. Because, you know, in my mind, I think Eric Glass is a storyteller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it is totally different because Shan Tianfeng's performance, and that is a performance, it's not a, it's not a show for 
radio. It's a performance. It's a live recording in in a stage. In yeah, front of a thousand people. Yeah. yeah, and that show is talking about the history, the story about Chinese history. So I think it is totally different from. The storytelling program we usually listen to, This American Life, the serial or startup, but I have an opportunity to listen to This American Life, so I know what is the storytelling in U.S. Sure. But I think for the ordinary people in China, they think Shan Tianfang is storytelling. So if I, you know, now I will promote our format of the show. I will tell you this is the Gu Shi Jiang Shu is storytelling. So they have two concepts. First is a is a bedtime. Mm-hmm. It's a bedtime story. Oh, <laughs> and another time, oh, it's a Shan Tianfang did. It's a it's a Xiang Shen or something. Yeah. So yeah, for me, I think wow, that is a long way to go for me. Sure. People in this society, they listen to that kind of radio show for maybe ten years, twenty years. It's long time education for them. So if you want to promote a new format to them, it's a it's a very long way to go. Sure. Yeah. Um, no, but, but, but still fascinating stuff though. I don't, I don't want to sell it too short. I mean, it's, 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 um, uh, you know, it's like a very old style of storytelling. You can imagine, yeah. um, you know, just one person telling like the entire story of Sambo. <laughs> it's sort of like, it's sort of like, like, like Homer sitting around a campfire, like telling the whole odyssey. Anyways. Is there, is this familiar format in the U S to talk about, you know, the civil war story or something? No, I, <laughs> independent I, war. <laughs> I was, I was thinking about it. There really isn't, uh, there really isn't a good analogy. You know, I used to, as a kid, my parents had these CDs of like Superman in the 1930s. Oh. Um, so like really old, like original storytelling on radio had this sort of serial quality. Ones that people remember um, are all like superheroes, not necessarily, you know, like ancient Greeks and Romans. But like that mythology. format is a, is a little bit like the, the radio play. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it, but it radio play, but like serialized and like goes on for thirty hours. Okay. Um, so not just like a, a condensed like one hour thing, but like a like a something that will last years. Yeah, uh, because I, I remember in well my my major in a college is about journalism. I remember there is a very famous radio play in in the U.S. in the nineteen twenties. It's called War of World. War of the Worlds. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that one, that was, that was, uh, I mean, that's like a, a still a classic today. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that was only like maybe three or four hours. Yeah. Um, not, not something you can like tune into every day uh, <laughs> driving, driving home. Okay. So, um, all right. So coming back to, uh, coming back to China in, uh, in the 2010s, Simalaya. Let's, yeah. So it founded in 2012. Mm-hmm. And what was the impact that it's had on the podcast ecosystem or audio ecosystem more generally here in China? When they launched before, at that time, there is two to three different kind of audio platform. First is this audio platform. It's totally different from Apple Podcasts because it's not just a distribution. It's more like Podbean, I think, because it's it's provide a host service, a hosting space for uh, the uploader. At at beginning. So so just to be clear for people who um, don't have their own podcasts, yeah, the, um, the the steps that it takes right now for you in the West to publish something on Apple Podcast is like actually really annoying. Um, mm. So first you you need to edit it and and mm. produce the software. Then you need to find a hosting platform, yeah. which generally costs around ten dollars. And after you do that, you have to submit your RSS feed to um, Apple Podcasts, yeah. to Spotify, to Overcast, to all the to all the platforms. So it's actually like a pretty cumbersome process that is that both costs money and takes, mm. you know, three to four hours and like spending a lot of time reading um, blog posts about the best yeah. way to do it. Yeah. But what what you're saying is what Simalaya was able to do is make that way more streamlined for the uh, for the creators out there. Yeah, because the 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 first version of this business model is every different a two to three uh, audio platform like Himalaya, Leisure, they provide a free uh, space to upload. So if you upload the show to their ser- server, it's free. Mm-hmm. It's not cost anything. But the business model is they attract a lot of different people, upload their show into their uh, platform, uh, let the platform become bigger and bigger, the different variety, you know, kind of show on their platform. So they will attract a lot of, lot of listeners. So the traffic will be bigger. And the traffic is, you know, is the business, is the money. So they will use this traffic to attract advertiser to pay. So that is the business model at the beginning. But they find the problem is, you know, the, the, they find the problem very quickly because they find audio is just a very small skills market in China. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people love video. 
and people love WeChat, you know, the the subscription account. It's a little bit like newsletter. Mm. Yeah. So people want to, you know, receive the messages uh, quickly or uh, will spend a, a long time to entertain. So video is a big choice. It's a good choice. Or article is a is a good choice, but it's not audio. Audio is a, you know didn't have their characteristics at that time. So they find their business model is 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 failure. So they need, need to try another one. Mm -hmm. So they they find a they try at during the I remember during the twenty fourteen to twenty sixteen. I remember they 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 try a lot of different things because like they were. Uh, they will invite some a celebrity to their platform to launch a show, but I still think it's that it doesn't work because it's, they just only could invite two or three or four celebrities, but there's that's enough. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So they think, oh, th this is not work. So finally, they find pay for knowledge. Mm -hmm. So that is the maybe the the famous business model now in the Western. World sure. <laughs> pay, pay for knowledge. So yeah. I um I was at uh, uh the Beijing train station two mm -hmm. or three weeks ago, and I'm getting off the train, and all of a sudden I see giant posters for an old professor of mine, which happened to be the worst professor I have ever had in China. He fell asleep every single time he gave he he had students give a lecture, and he had the gall to um to would after we would clap, he would wake up and then he would ask questions that we had <laughs> said exactly we literally said as soon as we were doing the presentations. Um, but um, anyways, whatever. He's a PKU professor. It's a famous <laughs> name. He gets to have a show on Shimalaya. Yeah. So um. So, so, um, and it's something people pay for. So, yeah. um, so why don't you talk a little more about what, um, what sort of content and what sort of crea creators are making this uh, pay for knowledge mm -hmm. content on, mm -hmm. on sites like Simalaya? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, well, first the pay for knowledge, I think we need to, uh, see it in the two different angles. First is the business model. So this model is a subscription. It's a little bit like you know, it's like Luminary now <laughs> doing. So it's just like uh, they, they need to, the audience to pay for their uh, the content they're listening directly, not uh, through the advertisement to transfer their the business value. Mm -hmm. This is first the, the the first angle is the business model way. Another angle is uh, is the content. So the content is self improvement. Yeah. Yeah. So like the 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 most popular topic is like. Well, uh, how to be successful in your workplace? How to build a better communication with your colleague? Yeah. Yeah. How to improve your EQ, the emotional I, e e EQ? How yeah, to EQ. Same. It's EQ in English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that is the popular shows for pay for knowledge. So that is very you know specific goal for the show. After 200 episodes, you listen to 200 episodes of the show, maybe you will have... You'll be rich, you'll be yeah. thin, you'll yeah. have better sex. Maybe not have better sex. I don't know if we have shows like that. <laughs> but, um, uh, but yeah, the, the general idea... Uh, what's the general background of the uh, of the creators? I know uh, a handful of them are professors, but what what else is the sort of background that makes you successful? Well, it's, it's, totally, it's, a, it's a, a totally different... People, you know, academics is part of that, but like uh, how to improve your EQ is hosted by Cai Kang Yong. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an entertainer. I, I think how to how to describe him, host, writer, entertainer. I think all of the above. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a a male opera. <laughs> 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 yeah, and uh, how to. Build your uh, connection with uh, with your colleague is uh, hosted by Ma Dong. is uh, is the host of a debate show. Okay. Yeah. So actually, they're celebrity. They're not uh, academics. So maybe they will do some research for their topics. But I, actually, I think their their show is not academic way. Their show is. Uh, I think it's. Uh, they're very conversational. The ones I've listened to. Yeah, I think. Well. I think that make the goal very specific yeah. than academic show. Because if this show is hosted by a professor, I think I could listen to some, the, the opinion will argue like, you know, this professor maybe has this opinion and another one has opinion. 
So maybe I could learn a lot of different things. But if a celebrity hosts this kind of show, the goal is very specific. Mm -hmm. Like you just need to know some tips. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Yeah, to improve yourself. So I think it's totally different kinds of things because Shima and I, they, they invited some professor of philosophy to introduce the, the history of the philosophy in the West. Sure. Yeah, so I think that is more like a lecture. I think that is hardcore. But how to improve your EQ is just, I think, maybe just like meditation. Yeah. <laughs> meditation, just like meditation. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk a little bit about censorship on these mm -hmm. on these platforms. So mm -hmm. I remember, uh, uh, I guess a year ago now, I tried to put some of my shows onto Simalaya. Mm -hmm. I think there was one that said like Trump trade war in the title, and um, that got taken down pretty fast. Oh yeah, because they, um, they now they have the English yeah. censorship yeah, person. Yeah, yeah, no, I was I was kind of impressed. I was like, and, oh, like there's and, someone in and, English there who's looking yeah, at this. Yeah, and there is and there is a, a sentence on their platform is the English works work hour is just during weekdays. Oh Jesus, <laughs> nice. Good for that. Chinese is every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no job bar for the um. Yeah, uh, so that's for just the fancy remind, English sensors. Yeah, it's just remind you if you sh your show is updated on Saturday or Sunday, please upload before that. <laughs> <laughs> so they can check you out. Yeah. Um, do you think like the 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 lines of what is acceptable and unacceptable on Shimalaya is like uh -huh. basically the same as what you'd see on Weibo or or, or in Weixin or are there di a little bit different standards? Well, okay. So, um, well, I, I I don't I could explain it, but I don't know your audience could get you know that's your audience could get this point because well I think in China um, the Shimalaya platform the in the government's eyes, is a media, is even a traditional media. Interesting. Yeah, they they have a, they have a, used the same way to control Himalaya, same as well as the radio station, the television station, the traditional newspaper. They're not very sensitive mm -hmm. about the, the 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 topics or the shows, because you know Weibo is very sensitive, the WeChat is very sensitive because they are internet company. But Shimalaya in government's eyes is a media. So they just use a different way to control. Okay. So as a media, so something like uh, we have a, uh, in, in China, in Chinese media, we have a, uh, a concept called the sensitive period, mm -hmm. like the, the Spring Festival, National Congress, or Tiananmen. Yeah, we got <laughs> Guoqin coming up. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the National Day, something. I had this experience that. Uh, some of my show, episode of my show, uh, will remove, but just during the uh, sensitive period. Oh, so it's an old show, and it was old fine show. for six months, but yep. a big anniversary yep. comes around, and yep. then they take it down. Yeah. Um, so, though, so that is that. That reminds me. So, oh, yeah, that way is a traditional media way, mm -hmm. because they just remove your show during the sensitive period, not you know when you upload. Sure. Yeah. So, 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 so your sense is for internet company platforms, like, you know, like, like Junior Totiao or, mm. um, or, or like Wasting House or what have you, they, they are more worried, um, yeah. and are, and are more active because in... they're 724. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sensor. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Coming now, not necessarily to these pay for knowledge shows, but shows that you in particular enjoy in, in Mandarin. Uh, what would you recommend to the listeners out there to get a sense of what interesting is happening in audio in Chinese? Okay. So. Uh, first, I, I have to say this, this was, I usually talk to my Western friend, paper knowledge and podcast in China is totally different thing. Mm -hmm. So if I want to recommend something is podcast, not paper knowledge. The most I want to recommend is, uh, is a Gush FM, a story FM. Mm -hmm. The New York times wrote articles about the show because, well, I love storytelling and I love the, this American life style storytelling show. So Gush FM is uh, familiar with that. Now the story FM is the one and only show in Chinese to use the way uh, storytelling. So I think this show has this value. Sure. So, so, yeah. you, so you're, you're friends with these guys, and uh, you said that you recently sent them uh, This American Life, but this wasn't something they were aware of beforehand. So I'm curious, where, where, where was their inspiration from, and what's, what's a little bit, could you tell a little bit of background about um, so, how yeah. they're doing what they're doing? Yeah. Yeah, so Story FM, I think, uh, uh, in my opinion, it's uh, just the score of 80 about This American Life. They just use... Uh, like like 80% eighty like eighty percent of the way there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. because there is a, often usually used the way is uh, let the storyteller 
uh, tell his own stories uh, directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they will cut the the voice from the interviewer. Just few voiceover in in our every stories because you know in in this market life, Hourglass is a storyteller, so. Uh, the hourglass or the producers will tell the story and use some qu quote from the weave it all together. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. But that show is the most of the part of the show is the storyteller's voice, mm -hmm. and uh, there's not the voice from host. So that's different from the story FM and the so Gusher one. FM. It's mostly they find different people yeah, and they tell, tell their, their own, own story, personal story. stories, and yeah. the editor will cut their interview maybe two hour interview into twenty minutes and let the let the interviewee tell the story like, you know, directly. Sure. Yeah, as, as a whole story. So that is the format. It's a little bit different from This American Life. But I, I think the reason behind that is this show is not weekly. This show is a third time a week. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they have a, a pressure about update. <laughs> sure. So they need to find a good way. It's balance, you know, convenience and the quality. So they find this. What are a few of your favorite episodes? I remember there is a story from a man in living Shanghai. And now at the present, his experience is just like a failure story. You know, in the ordinary people's eyes, he is just like a loser. Because he lost his wife, he lost his job or house or something. Mm -hmm. But in the 1990s, he is a doctor, I remember. Doctor uh, and graduated from a German college. So that episode is tell why he become from a winner to the loser. Mm -hmm. So that is very interesting because, you know, that up and downs we usually see in the Chinese society. Yeah. Yeah. So we think, oh, it's truly Chinese characteristic style. Uh -huh. it's, yeah. just, it's like the, 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 the life's up and down. Yeah. But what, what's interesting is this is this is very much in contrast to what you see in the mm -hmm. sort of like pay for knowledge universe where it's like, you know, it's lectures by really successful people telling, yeah. you, telling you how to be just as successful as them, as opposed to this sort of thing where you see a much more rounded um, uh, portrayal of people's mm -hmm. lives. Last October, I, I traveled to New York and I watched the storytelling show in a, in a bar. Mm -hmm. And finally, I, I talked to the director of that show is I asked her why American people love to listen to the story from the ordinary people. Because in China, I think people just love to listen to the story from the uh, successful man. Mm -hmm. uh, like Jack Ma, <laughs> Pony Ma, Jack Ma. Sure. So, yeah. Uh, she tells me that ordinary American people want to learn some experience from the ordinary people because we're the same. So maybe we have a totally different situation, but your experience, I think maybe we could learn from that. And I have... Maybe we'll share the same feeling with you, with your love stories, with your failure, you know, the life or something, maybe uh, with your happiness moment. So I think the, the, she tells me that the people love that feeling and they have opportunity to learn from, learn experience from the other people. But in China, I think people just think everyone has a big anxiety. Everyone has a big pressure. You know, you're, you think you have a big pressure. I still have a big pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so they think, oh, maybe the, the, the successful man's story will give me some, you know, truly tips of how to become success. Sure. Yeah. So that is a total different uh, the way to think. Yeah. <laughs> I showed up in China in June 2017, not knowing much more than Ni Hao. Two months later, I was HSK 3.5, confidently having hour-long conversations and traveling alone in rural Yunnan. By the time I started my graduate program that fall, I wasn't the foreigner who forced Chinese groups to switch into English. In my program, there were plenty of students who came to China with no Mandarin background, but none of them got to near the Chinese level I did, largely because they didn't have the right environment to invest in the basics. So where did I make all this critical progress? At CLI in Guilin, one of the few places that teaches Chinese right. In four hours of daily one-on-one -on -one sessions with engaged and flexible teachers, and in an environment that supports immersion outside the classroom. Unlike in Beijing or Shanghai, you'll be forced to use your Chinese in daily life, and won't fall into a friend group of expats. Guilin isn't your average Chinese small city either. As a tourist hub, it's developed enough to provide you with whatever creature comforts you want, from upscale gyms to chill cafes and fancy malls, all while being surrounded by gorgeous mountains and next to no pollution. 
CLI isn't just for Mandarin beginners. It supports all levels of learning. It's not just for students either. In fact, its median age is 28. To learn more, go to studycli.org and enter offer code CHINAECONTALK for $100 off. Support for this week's show comes from Brattle Street Educational Counseling. Stressed out about college applications? Brattle Street Educational Counseling can help. They provide guidance throughout the whole process and offer workshops for students looking to work in small groups at a rigorous pace. The workshops include hours of one-on-one attention, from college essays to standardized test prep to interviewing and applications. Brattle Street offers support for any student. Brattle Street B R A T L E Street dot com, helping you get where you want to go. Uh, so, so why don't you talk a little bit about your 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 new venture? First, I want to talk about my first podcast. This launched in 2015, but I'm at that time I'm a full time television editor, so I just it's just a hobby. Sure. Yeah, at that time I, I first listened to the This American Life. I think, oh, this is truly good format. So I want to learn from that. So I try to find some stories and produce some episodes. But because this is just a part time job, so and and it didn't earn any money. And the big biggest problem is no one <laughs> listened to it because oh, no. yeah because at that at that time you know uh, the Chinese people didn't know what is the podcast or they didn't have the habit of the podcast. Yeah, it's funny because even though it's you know lots of people in China have Apple phones yeah. and it's in it's a standard app so it's installed there. Um, it's installed there right away. But when I talk to Chinese people, um, and I tell them about my show and I'm like, Hey, you should subscribe. <laughs> um, and then they're like, what? And I'm like, search book on your phone and they don't believe me. And then they find it and they're like, Oh, oh weird. Yeah. What is this purple oh, thing? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. So, Oh, this, this logo is podcast. Yeah. I never use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So at that time, yeah, I, I, I faced the same situation as you. So I, I trigger a lot of podcast application yeah. <laughs> in my friend's phone. <laughs> so, uh, so at that time, it's very difficult to promote to promote my show because the people didn't have the habits. Sure. So yeah, so I want I want to talk more. Is I think Shimalaya has is has did do a good thing. Is they teach people how to listen. Sure. But then, of course, it's not use the Apple Podcast. It's use their own sh- application. But the educate people have a habit to listening. Sure. So, you know, now it's something you, you see people listening in the, in the, on the DTL, like yeah. going to work in, um, uh, in the supermarket or whatever. It's like, it's a, it's a habit now, mm-hmm. um, which is something that it wasn't necessarily in the U S five years ago, but more and more is becoming one. Yeah. So, uh, the last year, uh, uh, at, uh, actually it's in the late 2017. So my friend, uh, Roland Chen asked me, so do you have some interesting to co-host a, a podcast and show? Because he he know I'm doing a podcast before, mm-hmm. and I all, all often listen to the podcast. So he he was a journalist, so he think oh maybe we we could have our own podcast to invite our friends to chat or talk something. So I think oh of course I I want to do this. So I mean last February we launched our own Chinese podcast called Left Right. It's a it's a talk show and the topic is the cultural. Sure. But. I surprisingly find that the whole environment is changing. The environment of audio is changing now in China because mm-hmm. after maybe six months, I find we have a, you know our basic audience group. Uh, I found a lot of uh, friends know I'm doing a podcast. It's totally different from 2015. Interesting. Yeah, I could very easily to promote my shows. I just open your Shimalaya app and search my shows. Mm-hmm. So it's very easy to promote. So I think, oh, this... This, this yeah, so, so right now, Simalaya, I think it's like 50 million active users and very much concentrated in first and second tier cities. But it's self-reported number. <laughs> sure. well, who, who knows? Whatever. Lots of <laughs> lots of people, particularly the wealthier consumers in bigger cities, yeah, yeah. Um, are, are users of this app. So anyway, yeah. sorry, continue. No, no, no. So, so my show is growing. I think my show is growing very quickly. So I think, oh, maybe this market in China finally booming now. So because my show is not the first Chinese podcasting. In 2005, we, we already have the Chinese podcast called Anti-Wave. And the show even won an international award, a podcasting award. Mm. But, you know, because just few people use this application, 
during long period, maybe during 2005 to 10 2015. Years, yeah, yeah <laughs> 10 years. So uh, there was a lot of show uh, appears, disappear, appear, disappear. Sure. Yeah, but now I, I I find oh maybe the 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 podcast in China is truly booming. So I think oh maybe we could do this. So um, my 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 partner uh, created their his own sh- uh, company before. And he want to copy the Patreon. He want to build a Chinese version of Patreon. Patreon, yeah. Patreon, yeah. But it's <laughs> it's a failure. <laughs> yeah. So at that time he want to uh, launch another startup. So they think oh, maybe audio is a. Uh, it's a good topic. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So we think, oh, we could do this. So I think uh, I remember last September, he uh, rejected another company about audio. Uh, and we tried to, uh, you know, keep in touch with some brands. Because, we, you know, first of all, I have to say, in China, just few company or brands know podcast. Interesting. Yes. We have a lot of traffic. We have a lot of audience. And even there is a lot of shows like Wush FM, like any other podcast, have a big, you know, bigger and bigger audience than our my show. Sure. But just few in the, shows. In the like hundreds of thousands? Uh, Gush FM has uh, 100,000 subscri- subscriber. Sure. So I think the the play number is bigger than that. Yeah. So in the in the U.S., that would definitely be enough to support, um, you know, a number of people working working yeah. full time. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I use the middle rows. Though there is a calendar, uh, not calendar. There's a qi suan qi, zhenmu well, like a calculator. A calculator, yeah. calculator. Yeah. So, so just to be clear, so mid roll is like a in the in the West, it's a platform. Um, advertisement. It's an oh. advertisement platform. Yeah. So you can say, hey, my show is this big. Yeah, I do it yeah. this many times a week, and you can and you can it it can like estimate how many um you know how much money you'll be able to make. Yes. Sorry. So there is a calculator now on their website, and you could count how big your uh, business value behind your show. Yeah. Very easily. So. We use this to, you know, try to measure what, what, how big of my show. I think, oh, it's truly a big number, but we have no money. Why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think, oh, there's, I, we think, oh, there is some problem behind that. So at that time, we, we tried to uh, keep in touch with some company, some brands and educate them that, oh, there is a thing called podcast, you know, Shimalaya, right? So this is a big audio uh, market behind that. So yeah, maybe you have a, you give the opportunity to, you know, provide your advertisement to the television, to the video platform, to the WeChat. Maybe you try, you know, podcast, to try audio just to be clear so on simalaya right now Mm -hmm. if you listen to shows there's barely barely advertisements within them because the vast majority of money that simalaya makes is from people paying a hundred kwai or whatever Mm -hmm. to listen to them learning their you know how to upgrade their eq that is the big difference between uh the chinese audio environment and the uh the 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 americans uh, audio ecosystem that is simalaya has its own advertising department so they have opportunity to, you know, sell their content to the advertiser. You, you know, sell my show, sell our shows to the advertiser. Mm-hmm. But they earn money. Yeah. They didn't share the money with the, with the uploader. So that format, that model is a little bit like YouTube, but it's totally different from the YouTube. The uploader upload their shows to the platform. In, in YouTube, they, they will share the money with the uploader and the platform, right? Yeah. But in Shimano, the, the platform take it all. <laughs> 100% really. Yeah. So, well, so for me, there is, they, just give, they just give me a very bad experience of the show because every audience will listen to maybe 15 seconds clip advertisement before my show. Yeah. But but that's that is not my advertisement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's different from the Apple because Apple didn't do any business uh, in the podcast. The advertiser just give the money to the the production. Yeah. So this this is very different. In China, advertiser give the money to the platform, but the platform didn't share the money with the the, the podcaster. So I think oh maybe we need to build some different model in this environment because. The, the platform just have uh, their own power to promote these things. They just could have an opportunity to touch some brands, but it's just few. Uh, there is a lot of different company brands in China. I think we need to educate them, all of them, 
audio is a big market and audio is the next stop of your promotion. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. It's funny that that's the model, like the YouTube model. And basically everyone on YouTube, they, they have a YouTube ad blocker or they skip mm-hmm. ads or whatever. But the whole, the whole magic of advertising on podcasts mm-hmm. is you read the ad yourself and the host is endorsing it. And they say, oh yeah, you know, I use these razors. I am, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I subscribe, I use this website to make my website or what have you. Um, but that's not the value you that a Shimalaya is able to mm-hmm. make because they're not working with the creators to make sure that you know the you know the the pay hook, like the, the matching isn't right um and the the creators aren't bought in to you know really really sell um and use you know their position as a trusted host to sell whatever with whatever's being advertised so so anyways coming back to you and what you're <laughs> and what you're trying to and what you're trying to create here in China okay so so at the beginning uh, my partner and I just want to create a a, a, a venture is uh, like Gimlet it's just a podcasting production but finally we find oh this is not enough because maybe we have a, we have we could produce some good shows but it it, it didn't earn any money yeah so uh, we're trying to find some way to solve this problem so we, we we started to keep touch with the brands and we produced the show for the brands so we built our branded podcast uh, division first so we now we we launched two uh two different branded podcasts for two different company mm-hmm. and the, it would give uh, the cash flow to our company so i could use this cash to make my own original show that are Sure. So that is now at this point, this is my business model. But it so, f- so what were the two podcasts? Um, one is called the Startup Insider. It's uh, it's presented by uh, GGV. It's a it's a it's a it's a venture capital. Sure. Yeah, and they they already have of the Eng- famous nine nine six. Yeah, nine nine six. Yeah, but it's this English podcast. That we I we produce the Chinese podcast. It's totally different. Thing. Sure. And another one is uh, called. The the basis the basis note, the basi is a very famous uh is a very famous, I think the leader level person in the Chinese advertisement, and uh, the advertisement uh, market. Mm. Yeah, it's so because she is the former chairman of the W WPP China. Mm. You want to say the names of the podcasts in Chinese for uh, our listeners who are interested? Okay, so uh, the Startup Insider is called Chuang Ye Nei Mu, mm. and uh, the bestest note called Bei Wang Lu, but the Bei Wang Lu is not the, the usually Chinese character. The Bei is uh, Bao Bei, the Bao Bei, the Bei. Oh. <laughs> yeah, right. The uh, Wang is the observer, is the watch, the uh, guan, guan cha, kan wang the wang. Mm. So the plan now is to have a handful of branded podcasts, which you're now using for cash flow in order mm-hmm. to make more um original uh, podcast sure yeah so this is my this is my business model now but we think it's not enough <laughs> of course it's not enough sure because before my show there is some famous podcast before and they earn some money but some of the show finally failure because i think there is a reason behind that is that show is just see uh, themselves as a self media so they just do the business by themselves Mm. For themselves. Mm. So, well, just for example, uh, there is a brand maybe uh, give the advertisement to the show, but when the show not very popular, the brand remove. And the brand didn't will give the advertisement to another show. So that's totally different from America because in America, the company, maybe the, some company has the habit to continue give the advertisement to the different kind of podcast. Sure. But in China, they just have they just maybe support this show, and when this show not popular, they were removed. Yeah, yeah. So I think we need to change that situation. We need let the let the company knows the podcast is the thing you need to support, not just this show or this famous host or this celebrity or something. The whole industry you need to support. Sure, you could continue to sponsor every different kind of show. We have this kind, this show, this show, this show. You could continuously mm-hmm. to do it. So that is what we, we want to do in the future. Yeah. So it's a lot of infrastructure that uh, you you still need to build out, um, which is something that the U.S. hasn't really quite solved. But there are a number of different 
you know, competitors um, for what we were talking about earlier, like mid role, mm -hmm. um, to serve as sort of intermediaries um, to make the job of finding advertisers much more straightforward, um, mm -hmm. more easily explainable to the, you know, the head of branding or whatever, um, as well as making the podcast lives easier so they don't have to do the conversations that you had to do um, over and over again, say, like explaining what the medium is in the first yeah, place. Yeah, 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 right. So, so uh, before that, I wrote a newsletter uh, in Chinese uh, about podcasting called Just Pod. Uh, this newsletter is, uh, I, I just want to give the opportunity to educate I don't know who will read it, but I want to educate them what is podcasting. I will share some news uh, from the US or the UK and what their podcasters do, what their podcasting company do, and how their uh, business environment see this industry, something like that. So that is the, you know, the kind of education. And I, I also organize, uh, co-organize a podcast of China. Mm -hmm. That is an offline event in China. For the first time, we have a, a, a gathering. <laughs> the podcast industry, I think, the podcaster, producers, platform, uh, the te technical person, something like that. So we, we just have a, a different kind of panel, different kinds of topics to let them gather and talk about only seeing this podcast. Sure. Yeah, so I think that is a that is a good way to let uh let the podcaster see oh this is not just a part time uh, or just a hobby this is a career. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, that's very important because in China we didn't have NPR, we didn't have a uh, Gimlet before, so uh many people don't think it is an industry. They just think oh it's just something for fun. Yeah. Yeah, uh, weekday, uh, the weekend afternoon, we could invite my friend to chat something for one hour and I recorded it to upload into the platform. That's all. So they don't think, oh, that is the, the thing. But now I think we need to tell them it is the thing. You could do this. You could do this seriously. Yeah. Because that will um, become the business value behind that. Maybe now, now you could earn money now, but in the future, maybe uh, six months later or one year later, you could use your podcast to earn money, and then that will inspire you to prove your uh, to improve your quality of the show. That's very important because now in China, a lot of, I, I talked before, 99% podcasting, I think it is a talk show. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, maybe 99% of podcasting is amateur production. Yeah. People just use their part time to produce their show. So I think we need to change. We need to something as the, see the podcast as a full time job, like me do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I quit my full time job in television station to uh, get my full time job in podcasting. So I think we need this kind of change in China. Yang Yi, best of luck and thanks so much for being a part of China Econ Talk. Okay, thank you, Jordan. Thanks for having me.